Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and the second of today's double bill and the last of this week's set of El Alamein shows. So we are now officially halfway through. Through This is show seven with another six next week. And we are still, of course, talking about the battles of North Africa and a special focus on the El Alamein campaign. But today we're looking at the events of December. So this is a month or so after the main battle of, of El Alamein. And we're looking at that period that is described variously as the pursuit, a rearguard action, a withdrawal, the mopping up I've even read. And it's about those next engagements between the 8th Army and Rommel's retreating Africa Corps. So my guest today is a uh, first time on World War II TV. Uh, Zita Balanja Fetcher is a blogger, a military editor, a writer. She writes under the pen name of, of Zeta Steele, and she has a website, and all the information is in there below, and she particularly is interested in the leadership and their styles, the characters, the the, the, the men behind the, the field marshal's batons, so to speak. So I'm going to bring Zeta in now. So um, good afternoon. How are you today? Hi. I'm doing pretty good. Thank you so much for having me. This is wonderful. I'm excited, and I hope everyone likes the presentation. Well, I hope they do too. So the first question I'm putting to everybody these two weeks is is really about when the battle for North Africa kind of popped onto your radar. And I always explain as a kid, it was very early for me. It was in the comics I've read when I was, you know, pre-10 pre years old. I think I was already aware of El Alamein and Tommy's out there in the desert. Um, but that's because I'm British. And with my Australian guest, New Zealand guest, and now as an American guest, I'm intrigued as to kind of when it popped on your radar. Um, I think it first came to my attention when I was in middle school, um, when I was studying World War II. Um, I heard that there had been a, a battle and a campaign in Egypt, and I was really interested in Egypt, and so that got my attention. I started to do research on my own in my teen years, and I would have to say that the book that really brought it to life for me, hopefully you can see it, um it's called the war in the desert and it, it's it was coming it was it was lost it on the green screen a bit because uh -oh. it's the same well it's called the war in the desert and it's a time life book from 1977 and it's really uh, rich with photographs and uh different details about all aspects of the battles in north africa and that really had me hooked so well, that's that's a, a great start. And the, the thing is, you know, as we had with John Parshall on the second show, is that it, the, an American observer of this battle perhaps is a little bit more um, neutral and unbiased because second, perhaps only the Battle of Britain and um, and um, Arnhem, the El Alamein is for us Brits. It's loaded with all the iconic imagery of bagpipes and minefields and the you know, 51st High End Division, all that kind of stuff there. And maybe we're not as objective because of that. I know I'm not fully objective because of that kind of youthful pride I had in, in the, the opening barrage. But anyway, you've come armed with a magnificently detailed PowerPoint. So I'll load that up on screen and uh, you'll you'll take us, take us through that. So folks, the same way as with Professor Harper this morning, we'll kind of do questions that pertain to the exact details we're talking about as we go along. And any kind of broader ones we'll do at the end. But um, I think we're going to sit back and and, and have an interesting idea about these two figures. And uh, the thing about we always know about Montgomery is, and 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 um, Rommel is everybody's got an opinion. They may not agree with it, but everybody's got an opinion. I'm interested in yours. So For over sure. to you. <laughs> okay, so let's get started. Um, just to give you a general overview um, of, of where I'm taking up with this. Um, we're looking at the period after the Battle of El Alamein uh, when Rommel was basically, he was just in full retreat. Um, at this point, he, he drew back to a place called El Aguila, where he had repelled the British twice before in the past. And this was a very rough uh, wilderness area in the desert. And this, this location effectively controlled who would hold the gateway into Egypt. Um, so it was a key location. So just to give you a general overview, um, first of all, I'll be talking about Monty and Rommel. Um, I'll go into their background, their personality, their different experience as commanders, uh, their leadership style, and some of their methods. Then I'll get into the build-up to the battle, uh, take a look at what happened after El Alamein, uh, other forces that played a role in the battle besides uh, the ones that were on the battlefield, like politics and the media, for example. 
then I'll discuss the battle itself and some of um, some reflections from Monty and Rommel and also from me um, about it. And then if you have any other questions, um, I'll be glad to take those afterwards. So first off, we'll we'll talk about the opponents. Um, I think this is important just to get a sense of who they were and, and how they really interacted with each other here. Uh, so we'll start off talking about Rommel. Now, just to give you an idea of his background, so he was born into an upper middle class family. Um, he, he was known as a pretty good kid, generally. Um, he did occasionally clash with his father and he was described as a bit stubborn and muley when it came to doing schoolwork that he didn't want to do. But otherwise, he, he didn't really uh, come across as a troublemaker or a rebel or anything. Um, he was generally quiet, generally easygoing. He liked animals. Um, he was very science and math focused. And he almost became an engineer. It's not altogether clear whether his father steered him into soldiering or whether he decided that for himself, but it is known that there was a, a debate in his mind about whether he would become a soldier or an engineer because of his love of building things. And in this picture in the center, you can see him circled in red. Uh, that's him building a, a, a glider with his friends as, as a kid. Uh, so moving on to his personality, uh, Rommel was a very energetic guy. He got bored really easily and he just could not sit still. And I would think that um, this was a bit of a detriment to him in, in a certain sense in his military career. I think uh, on the one hand, he was able to make some really dazzling achievements as a soldier, but his, his desire to always be active and always create action did work against him later. He was a pretty social person. I think a lot of people have a, a concept of Rommel as being kind of, um, you know, a withdrawn character who just kind of liked to sit at home with his family and not do anything. But um, based on my uh, study of Rommel, I think he was a very social guy. He liked dancing. He liked parties. He liked interacting with people. Um, whenever he went on uh, vacations, he, he liked to do group activities, group hikes, group skiing. He was a very group focused person. Um, he, he also built a lodge in Germany with some of his friends from World War I. Uh, he did tend to be kind of reserved, uh, but he was known as a very friendly person and he was pretty gregarious with other people. Um, in terms of his war experience, I think it's important to note that Rommel's only combat experience before World War II was World War I. And this is very different from Monty. And, and I also think that in a way um, it was a little detrimental to Rommel, at his military career, because he didn't have a wide breadth of experience. I mean, he certainly uh, had a lot of, you know, very dangerous situations and things that he overcame and learned during World War I. But I would say that his formation as a soldier ended there in some ways. Um, he did serve as a police chief in Schwäbisch Gmund, and he did um, have to be active in riot control because there was a lot of civic unrest in Germany during that time, but it's not quite the same thing as soldiering. Uh, during World War I, he served as a Gebirgsjäger, so um, he was a mountain trooper, so his tasks were very or oriented around skiing, climbing, um, going over difficult terrain. Um, I would argue that the Gebirgsjäger are kind of like a type of German special forces. They're very elite, fit troops. Rommel enjoyed his time as a Gebirgsjäger, and he was very enthusiastic about skiing and mountain training even after the war. Uh, he was wounded three times, uh, shot in the leg and arm, and then he suffered a broken ankle when someone rolled a rock down on towards him. Um, down a hill. And another important thing to note about his military service was that he often served as an infantry point man. So this is a very dangerous position. It's right at the front of, of a column and Rommel preferred to be a point man. He wanted to be right up at the front seeing everything. He was very good at being stealthy. 
he was rarely taken by surprise. And I think that this, um, his desire to be a point man kind of developed this sixth sense that he became known for. Um, in terms of his leadership style, he really identified himself as an infantryman. Um, so remember I told you that he was a very group focused social kind of a guy. Uh, well, this kind of came into play with his leadership. He saw himself as part of the group of soldiers. He, he was very much, um, he would very much take the approach with them that he was one of them. He would sometimes get out of his car and work alongside them, help them with different things. And he he really retained his techniques that he used in World War One in terms of being at the front. He would kind of want to move around and see things for himself in the front areas, and he would just expect his administration to just catch up with him, which didn't work uh, many times in North Africa. He was constantly on the move, um, and he also was unpredictable, and sometimes his staff couldn't locate him easily. But his men liked it. Um, they thought that he was a very dynamic, exciting person. In terms of his methods, he really kept his personality out of his approach to war. It was, it seems to me that, uh, that war was kind of a problem solving exercise for him. He kind of used his engineering mindset to focus on fortifications, focus on how to counteract the enemy, um, very kind of in a mathematical way, I would say. He didn't really show any interest that I have found in politics or world history or historical figures. Um, he had a kind of a very, um, I would say, detail-oriented and dry approach to uh, battle. Um, he knew how to motivate his troops uh, because he identified with them so closely. After battles, he would work out um, on paper or different ways that things could have happened and analyze lessons. And I also would say that he approached war like a game sometimes. He was really interested in interacting with his opponents and seeing what they would do and, and improvising. He kind of sought contact with, with um, the people that he was fighting against. Um, he was very aggressive, very opportunistic, and he was constantly exploiting new situations. Um, and I think that all of this made him a very tough opponent. So now we move on to Monty. This will be fun. Very different character here. Um, so unlike Rommel, uh, Monty didn't come from a very comfortable background in terms of, um, you know, his parents or the life that he had as a child. Uh, he writes that his family was very poor. Uh, he was, um, he felt like he was neglected. His father was usually never there and was very busy being a bishop. And his mother, he, he describes in his writings as abusive and, um, you know, physically beating him when he misbehaved. Uh, he was a very mischievous kid. He liked to get into things. Um, he loved sports and running around. Um, he did not have much parental influence. He didn't like his mother, and he did like his father, but his father was never there. Um, so he pretty much had to learn to stand on his own, as he wrote uh, from an early age. Unlike Rommel, he always wanted to be a soldier. Um, he said in a BBC interview that he saw soldiers going off to fight in the Boer War, and he, he knew right away that that was the stuff for him. Um, in terms of his personality, uh, I think that Monty was kind of a, a swashbuckler in a lot of ways. I think people have a perception of him as being this kind of hermit-like, uh, reserved, bookish sort of fellow, but that's not what comes out to me when I'm studying Montgomery. Uh, he described himself as a bad boy. Um, he really embraced his rebel personality. He didn't care what other people thought about him. Um, he, you know, for someone whose father was a bishop, you know, his, his kind of irreverent sense of humor, getting multiple tattoos on his arms, um, being very outspoken, um, and, and in some cases people would think that he was rude. Um, this just didn't really jive with the religious background of his family. So he was, I think, you know, a, a rebel, and he clearly liked that about himself. 
Um, and he didn't really allow people's perceptions to change the way that he wanted to be or his, his personality. Unlike Rommel, he really liked contact sports. Um, I think both of them liked sports and athletics, but where Rommel was focused on things like skiing and swimming and hiking and doing it together with a group, Monty really liked aggressive kind of sports like rugby, um, other things like that, where you're focused on just beating the opponent. So I would say in terms of personality, I think Monty actually had a more aggressive personality than Rommel. And just to jump in there, because one of the things that has come up in recent years is the suggestion that Montgomery was on the spectrum somewhere, you know, um, autistic or Asperger's or, or something like that. What's your, I mean, I'm not asking you to give a diagnosis, but what's your immediate reaction to that? I don't think so. Um, I, I don't think so. I, I think he had, um, he had pretty good social skills. Uh, he did like other people and have any had friends. He, he was able to, um, I think a lot of people say things like that because he could be difficult um, with people and because he was kind of a loner. Um, but I just think that was the way his personality was. And um, I think he just didn't really care about if people perceived him as, as difficult. Um, that's just what comes across to me. Um, his writings that I have read um, reflect a really sophisticated grasp of human relationships, politics, world history, uh, things like that. So I, I just think it was his personality that people could perceive to be a little difficult. And I will say that a lot of famous generals are kind of notorious for being difficult characters. Yeah, abs absolutely. I mean, not they're, they're all, along with people. Yeah, I mean, they're all, a lot of them are, 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 are by some standards, they're weird. MacArthur, Patton, <laughs> Montgomery, you know, they're, they're all a bit odd. But um. <laughs> I think you know it's a, it's worth mentioning that everybody, myself included, we we look at a lot of Montgomery and indeed Rommel through other people's lenses, and some of those people didn't like Montgomery. You know, he, he as we will get into it, he it's come up so far this week. He tends to get on with his subordinates quite well, but and it's his peers and people above him he he maybe struggles with, um, and and maybe that the same could be said for Rommel. And I think you know. It, I mean, it's refreshing that someone like yourself has sort of gone back and kind of cut through the weeds a bit and actually built up from the beginning. Because I think a lot of us are rather burdened with being given, we've, we've been spoon fed other people's opinions of Montgomery and haven't necessarily made our own. And it's, we're victims of this, of that world we grew up in, of, in my case, of just World War II being sort of everywhere when I was growing up. And, uh, and so it's, it's, it's really refreshing. People are amazed at the, the stuff you're, you're bringing up about both of these gentlemen. So, so brilliant stuff. I'm really glad that, that you like it. And I, I do agree with you that things get filtered through secondary sources. And for me, it just helps to go back and read their words, see for myself, look at the news reels, read their writings, and try and form an opinion based on based on that in addition to other sources. I think that's really helpful. Um, in terms of combat experience, I, I would also say that Monty had a, a very rich and diverse experience as a soldier compared to Rommel. So not only did he fight in World War I, but he also had combat experience during the Irish War of Independence, the an insurgency in Palestine. Um, during World War I, I would like to note that he fought with distinction in a bayonet fight, which is a very, you know, violent, fierce kind of action. He, he was noted for having gallant leadership during this, and he was awarded the DSO. So I also think that this, to me, this kind of counteracts, in a way, uh, perceptions of Monty being sort of a desk-bound, desk bookish sort of soldier. I think people have built up that perception about him. But I, I think that somebody who, you know, was a brawler in his youth, who who fought with this distinction in a bayonet fight, I just don't think that those two things add up. I don't see him as a a bookish, you know, um, reserved kind of, of guy. Um, I would say he was a bit brash, actually. Um, and he learned over time to control himself and to be more restrained. Um, unlike Rommel, he sustained more severe injuries. So he was shot through his lung. Uh, he was almost left for dead and, and buried. Um, he narrowly escaped um, being 
buried in there, which was must have been horrifying. Um, he also was shot in the knee, and he had some long-term internal injuries from from this. Uh, he later told someone that he had half a tummy and one lung. So this is something that he had to live with. Um, Rommel didn't have as, as severe injuries as Monty. Another interesting thing to note is that Monty sought to improve his mind and he sought to expand his knowledge of, of being a soldier. He wrote that when he was lying in the hospital, he thought that he really wanted to understand his profession more and that he realized there was more to being a soldier than just fighting on the front lines. So he worked as a staff officer. He learned the ins and outs of military administration and what he called the stage management of battle. And evidently he was good at it because he became a chief of staff of, of a division by the age of 31 during World War I. And after the war, he continued to seek out higher education and try and improve his, his knowledge and abilities. I think that he sought out more opportunities to enrich his knowledge as a soldier than Rommel did. Um, in terms of leadership, he also, like Rommel, he loved to interact with his troops. Uh, he also strongly identified as an infantryman, but unlike Rommel, Monty wasn't the kind of guy who was just going to get out of his jeep and start helping somebody do work. Um, he, there was really no doubt about um, his role and who was in charge. Uh, he was aware that he had a leadership position that was very distinct and different from the fighting troops. Uh, he was able to maintain close contact with his troops without losing contact with his staff. So I think this is a big point. He, he knew how to interact with the men and get them on his side and get everybody excited without going off into the boonies and, and having his staff wondering what happened to him. Um, he loved to tell jokes. He had a, a pretty, I think, pretty funny sense of humor. This went over well with the soldiers. Um, sometimes he came across, I think, as completely spontaneous, but he was a pretty calculating guy. He sat back and thought about war and methods very carefully. Um, in terms of his approach to war, he was very passionate about his profession. I think to a degree that Rommel might not have been. He studied everything you could. He loved to go look at battlefields, artifacts, museums, uh, different types of weapons. Uh, he studied leadership and policy. Uh, I, think, I think in some ways Monty reminds me of some of the special forces professionals that I've interacted with. They're just really enthused about uh, being a warrior and trying to to learn everything they can about it. And I don't really see the same sort of, of raw enthusiasm from Rommel. Um, for Monty, war was definitely personal, unlike Rommel. Um, for Monty, it was all about personality. He really focused on human character and motivations. And he didn't mind, you know, showing his own personality and having, you know, having that in his work or talking about his thoughts. You don't really see an effort when you read Montgomery's writings for him to just sanitize himself out of his his memoirs like Rommel. I mean, he'll tell during uh, his memoirs, Monty will tell, you know, humorous stories. He'll explain why he thought the way he did. Um, Rommel's is a lot more cut and dry. You have to do some really careful reading to try and see where Rommel's personality comes through. Um, Let's jump in again. Sorry, I, I like jumping in. Is that you said earlier that Rommel very much sees it as kind of problem solving and almost like a chess game. And, and maybe that kind of how, half explains a bit more aggression and maybe a, not a lack of care about his men, but the fact it's all about the problem. Whereas Montgomery has always got the awareness that it is a war and wars are terrible and wars, you know, he, he was shot through the lung in that war and that it is human lives. It, it, it's all very well to see it as a problem, but it, it, it never stops being the loss of human beings. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, I, I would agree with you. I think that Rommel drove his men very hard. And, and there is also a distinct difference in the way that Monty tried to provide for his men to make them as comfortable as he could, uh, and Rommel, who did not. Um, for Rommel, it was all about getting the task done, 
Um, you know, he didn't necessarily care how hot or dirty or inconvenient it was. It was just everybody had to pull together and accomplish this work. Uh, but for Monty, he realized, I think, having been in, in the terrible conditions in, in the trenches in World War I and so on, that how important it was to make people as comfortable as possible, to make sure they had newspapers, to make sure they had little comforts like that. And I think that that made a big difference uh, with, at, for Monty as a leader, um, as opposed to Rommel. So uh, I would definitely agree. Okay. Uh, in terms of communication, I would say Monty was also a little bit better at communicating than Rommel. He was good at getting uh, his administration and troops to do what he wanted. Rommel kind of had a sort of war with his administration. He just perceived them to be bureaucrats who just were incapable of understanding what the troops needed. And it was kind of an adversarial relationship there. He wasn't really very good at working with his administration. Um, in terms of the approach to war as a game, I would say that Monty was very different. I think he approached it as like a contest of dominance between himself and the enemy commander. He, unlike Rommel, he didn't like to get out there and, and put out feelers and spar and, and that kind of thing. For Monty, it was just about winning, about crushing the enemy. Um, I think he was certainly capable of improvising, but from my perspective, I think he really liked to take the approach of complete control and sort of just like a boa constrictor taking his time and just crushing his opponents. I think that's the way he liked to do things. I think he was capable of doing things differently, but that was kind of his MO. Unlike Rommel, Rommel just kind of liked to improvise. He liked to see what was going on with the opponent and then change his plans. Um, Monty would never allow himself to change his plans just because of what his opponent was doing. Um, he was extremely controlling and didn't want the enemy to draw him out or influence him in any way. So now we move on to the build up to the battle. Um, I think it's important to note Rommel had already planned the invasion of Cairo. He had planned for agents working for Germany to blow the Nile bridges and that the local population was supposed to help the Germans. Um, they were supposed to kind of rebel against the British in the city. And this could have been a reality because Rommel was not very far outside of Alexandria. He was, I believe, about 60 miles from there when he eventually ground to a halt. Um, he tended to see British commanders as old school, as overcautious. Um, he kind of liked to get out there and take a poke at them and chase them around and then like write about what he thought was wrong with their methods and things. I think he enjoyed uh, giving them the runaround out there. Um, but Monty was very different. He did try and test Monty at Alam Halfa. And based on Monty's response, which was kind of just to swat him away, um, he underestimated Monty as cautious. And this is exactly what Monty wanted. So at El Alamein, Rommel did not expect that anything would happen. He was convinced that, that everything was quiet and he thought it was safe to actually leave North Africa for r, &R because he had worn himself ragged living like the, the rest of his troops. I think that Monty's element of surprise really shocked the Germans. He literally, if you think about it, he just ripped up an impassable minefield and just went straight through it. I don't think that the Germans expected that to happen at all. Um, and the um, the general, General Stumme, who was supposed to be a substitute for Rommel, uh, he was so overwhelmed by all of this, he ended up getting chased in a car in a very dramatic incident. He actually died of a heart attack. Um, so the Germans were definitely panicking. Uh, Hitler personally called Rommel on the phone and asked him to go back over there. So that just gives you an idea of how critical the situation was. Rommel comes back, he begins a fighting retreat. And during this retreat, Operation Torch begins on November the 8th. So this was the Anglo-American invasion of French Morocco and Rommel knew that he couldn't last in North Africa anymore. Once Operation Torch had happened, 
he wrote that it spelled the end of his army in Africa. But he had a much more immediate problem at this point because Monty was pretty close by. He had just really given Rommel a thrashing at El Alamein, and now he was chasing him. So his priority was to deal with Monty. During the retreat, Rommel was really low on supplies, and part of this was due to uh, the British having decoded the Enigma machine, they were uh, they were you know getting Rommel's messages, telling about the supply situation, and a lot of things that were being shipped over to him were being sunk in the Mediterranean. Uh, during this time, Rommel frequently got stuck in the desert because he was waiting for gasoline to arrive, so it didn't he couldn't escape as fast as he wanted. Um, but he still did his darndest to get away. Monty was stalking him from a relatively short distance. So Rommel had his men plant mines, and many of these were improvised explosives. Some of them included like a thousand pound Luftwaffe bombs that were rigged to explode. So he used his engineering talents to come up with some really nasty um, devices to slow the British in their pursuit of him. And as he got closer to um, a territory that the Axis had held for a while, his supply crisis began to be alleviated. So as he pulled further away and out of Egypt, he was getting supplies easier. And this caused a problem for Monty. Uh, so for Monty, he actually wrote, writes that the advance was becoming sticky that he was actually experiencing anxiety and it was the first real anxiety he had since assuming command and that chasing Rommel for such a long distance had put a severe strain on his administration. So now Monty was starting to have a supply crisis. Also, Monty had kind of hoped that once he took Benghazi, that supplies would be able to reach him there from the port. But Rommel's troops had sabotaged basically the heck out of Benghazi and absolutely nothing worked at all in the port. It was totally inoperable. Uh, Monty thought that it would take months to get the port working again. So his ability to replenish his troops and, and supply the British army was a matter of urgent priority he wrote and that and to jump in again now again Zita, because i like jumping in sorry to just stop your flow no, is, that, is that what we understand about montgomery is he when he commits to anything he likes to know he's got backup he likes to know he's got stores supplies things behind him so other generals i mean rommel included don't they, they're a bit more kind of willing to kind of fly by the seat of their pants and they, they kind of think about the 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 aftermath later on but in this situation i can understand even if montgomery's got enough for the next day or two he'd want to have enough for the next two or three weeks that's just the kind of guy he is he likes to have lots of artillery lots of shells lots of everything so i, I think this is this is an interesting angle here because as, as we've been talking about this week is whether we describe this period as a pursuit is it as do we do we label it from the british point of view or the commonwealth point of view or the german point of view is it, is it a chase is it a withdrawal and it's it, it, that's I'm really pleased you focused on this prayer because it's 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 opening up the same old problems of logistics that have been the both sides have been facing for the last two years, and it's really playing into their their respective strengths and weaknesses and their mastery or otherwise of logistics and supplies. So um, yeah, it's it's a really fascinating prayer. Thank you for um kind of uh, explaining it all. It's really great. I think that Monty understood this also that the tables were being turned on him, and this is as part of what made him just so worried when, when he was approaching Elagila. He was also worried because um, the British soldiers knew that this was a tough place to take. They had been repelled twice from this location, you know, and, and Rommel had used the terrain to his advantage there. He had um, used the, the sand dunes um, to different patches of rough terrain to, to deceive and to drive the British off. Um, and he used this really as his springboard into Egypt. Uh, so this was kind of like his turf. Um, so Monty, I think if Monty had had more supplies and more backup, he would have felt more confident approaching mm -hmm. Elagila. But the fact that things were waning, that things were difficult, made him pretty apprehensive about how he was going to actually take this position. 
So I think I've already gone over this. Um, these are just a few photos here um, on the left and in the center. Those were actually taken by Rommel of the desert. And um, you can kind of see the visibility is pretty low um, in the one in the middle. Um, sandstorms were frequent in the Elagila area. Rommel had been known to use these to his advantage. He also had in the past created dust clouds using trucks to deceive um, his opponents about how many tanks and troops that he had, about what direction he was coming from. So as Monty's troops approached this place, they really felt spooked. They really felt like they had bad memories of this place. Things had seemed in the past to be going well for them. And, and this was the spot where things had gotten ruined before twice. It was like a bad luck area. Wow. Uh, so Monty wrote that as, as they approached Elagila, he sensed a feeling of anxiety in the ranks. And he, he personally thought that they would have to do some serious fighting to take this position away from Rommel. Interestingly, Monty called this atmosphere, he called it the Agila bogey. So like there was some kind of creepy atmosphere around El Aguila that they, the troops just, they, they weren't convinced that they could win. They had just come out of the victory of Alamein, but when they got to El Aguila, their confidence was really being shaken. So a tense standoff kind of developed. Rommel, in the meantime, was was really upset that he had not received more supplies. He had felt like his his army had been treated like a sideshow, and he didn't feel like he was getting enough support from the high command or enough direction. So he he doesn't dig in too much at, at his position. He wants to be able to stay mobile. He goes in throughout late November, he starts seeking consultations with with senior Italian and German officials to try and get guidance about what to do. It's an emergency. He even travels to Europe. Uh, Monty, in the meantime, he has been in the desert for a while. So he goes back to Cairo before the battle to wash up, to get refreshed. And he tells his troops to become more deeply entrenched in their position. Um, let's see, I think my screen's a bit frozen here. Uh, yep, temporarily frozen a bit. Hopefully, it'll come back again. <laughs> uh, let me let me drop it out and drop it in again. Okay. No, I think it's still. Well, I can move things on, but you're you're stuck. Do you want do you want to leave the meeting and come back in again and see if that works? Um, will it work? Um, yeah. If if you think that's a good idea, I can just hop in and hop out. Yeah, we'll do that, and I'll I'll fill in without without you. Yeah, try that. Okay. Yeah, these things happen, folks. We'll just bring Zita back in again. It was um, uh, just the uh, screen froze there, so we can't go. It is an amazingly good show. I'm loving it. I hope you're loving it as well. And uh, the sidebar, I can't believe, well, I can believe because I'm watching it day by day, how good the, uh, the the sidebar conversations are going each day now. There's some really, really good stuff coming out. I have to go back and read them all. So it's um, fantastic stuff. So uh, thanks for all your 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 comments and things there. And I'm really planning on more, more, more theme weeks for next year already. So yeah. Uh, Let's uh, let's see if Zeta comes back in, and uh, and um, we'll get it back in hopefully, and um, that will be good. And uh, yeah, by the way, the shows we have next week we have Giulio from Italian Military Archives coming on to talk about the Italian point of view. We have one on the Royal Wiltshire Yeomanry, so kind of armor focus. We have our South African show, David Brock Katz is going to be taking us through the South African division and their role. We've got James Colvin who wrote an incredible book about the training and doctrine for North Africa. He's coming in. And then what's the last show? There's there's one more, I think. Oh, I can't remember what it is. My brain has just gone frozen on me, I like like Zeta's screen. And I think the last one is oh yeah, we've got um the 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 great show on uh the um the minefields, uh the, the major and the development of, of mine clearing techniques. So that's our that's our set of shows next week. And then after that, I've got a break for a few days where I go to Germany, and then we're starting on the Sino-Japanese War. And then we've got a week about uh, uh, resistance fighters and lots more still stuff coming up before for um, Christmas. And then after Christmas, we have two weeks about the Battle of Stalingrad and the greater battles in the Eastern Front. So that will be next. So Sita's back in. So she's got to load okay. up the PowerPoint again. Yeah, um, I've just been right. filling in without you. Yep, I'll just get my PowerPoint up again. Yep. 
Sorry for the um, delay, everybody. No, well, Glenn's fr uh, screen this morning froze four times. It's just we can, we're we're played by the internet. It's fine. So um, yeah, we'll just bring it back up and um, we'll carry on. Where did we get up to? We got up to. Uh, I yeah. think Brahma was about to have some consultation in Europe. That's it. Yeah, there we are. So just got loaded up. And uh, yeah, people have been really enjoying it. So uh, that's good. I'm glad. Um, I still can't see. It's not come back in again. You have to do, you have to go into present slides and then double click it and it should just pop back in again. Oh, okay. I tried to re-upload the PowerPoint. No, you don't shouldn't. There we go. There we go. The, yeah. All right. So just pardon me, everybody, while I just hop in. It's it's fun. We were just we would take we could take our breath and uh, and chill out. And I reminded people what we got coming up over the next few weeks. So it was a good opportunity to, to update people. So it's been fun. So there we are. Good. Back uh, to you. Okay. All right, so now we'll discuss some of the other forces that influence the Battle of Illegala, namely politics and the media. Um, Rama was really stuck in a difficult position, I will say, because he was subordinate to both Hitler and Mussolini, who are probably the two worst bosses you could ever have, and he had to answer to both of them. Um, each dictator had very different priorities, for Hitler, um, North Africa was a sideshow to his grand war that he believed he was launching on the Eastern Front. That was supposed to be his um, ideological German versus Slav war. Um, that, that was what he was really obsessing about um, for propaganda reasons. So he definitely believed he had bigger fish to fry than, than North Africa. He did believe that it was great that Rommel was doing well there and that they got some good propaganda out of it. Um, he liked to hear about victory, um, but when things started to go badly, he didn't really care. Um, he was habitually detached from his followers and situations. Um, when, when his followers needed him, he had a habit of abandoning them. Um, he really catered to people who flattered him, which you can see in the kind of people he surrounded himself with in, in his inner circle. And he didn't really believe in making compromises. He was perfectly happy with soldiers dying just for the sake of good PR and coming across as having an iron will. Um, Mussolini, on the other hand, he had a different view of North Africa. Um, the Italians had tried to really reestablish an empire in North Africa. They had displaced native North African people and it replaced them with Italian settlers uh, committing crimes uh, to try and, and clear out the locals and replace them with Italians to try and build up his idea of, of the Roman Empire that he was trying to create. So he had a lot to lose if things really went south in North Africa. He wanted Rommel to try and save his resources. He didn't want Rommel to just stand there and, and just die like Hitler envisioned you know, for, for PR. He wanted Rommel to try and protect Italy's assets there. So he tended to micromanage. He was emotional. He was interfering. But he was also dependent on Hitler for resources. The Italians couldn't do things by themselves. They really needed the Germans to help them out. So Mussolini also didn't really have complete freedom of action because his destiny was really tied to Hitler. So in terms of command, this was just a mess. Um, each dictator really refused to accept even the idea that they were going to lose Africa. It just didn't occur to them that that could happen. So when things started to go south, uh, Mussolini wanted Rommel to resist. He wanted him to save the Italians um, and, and do whatever he could if he had to, just to, to protect Italy's assets. And Hitler was saying, well, you know, sometimes this happens in history, just like make a big, you know, make a grand death for yourself and your troops and just die fighting. So he was getting conflicting orders from both of these two characters. And he wrote that, he had still received no strategic decision from the German and Italian authorities about the future of the overall theater of the war. He said they did not look at things realistically and that they refused to, and that he had to continually circumvent orders from the Fuhrer or the Duce to save the army from destruction. 
I do not believe that he actually wrote down all of the, the various orders that he that he had to circumvent. I think it would have been interesting if he had. Um, we only know about a few of them, like the victory or death order at El Alamein, for example. Um, but according to Rommel, this happened multiple times uh, that he received orders that would have led to his troops' destruction that he had to disobey. So to give you a clearer picture of what exactly Rommel was being told or not told to do, um, we'll just take a look at what was going on here with Hitler. Um, after the landings at Operation Torch, Hitler told Rommel to just forget about Tunisia and just assume that they would hold North Africa. Because Rommel was trying to ask, well, what about this? What what if, you know, what if they get over here? You know, try to, to come up with different responses to evolving situations. Hitler did not want him to think about that. He just wanted him to think, we're going to win. You know, don't even act like they're going to gain more ground because they're just not. And and of course, that wasn't realistic. He told him to hold the Legila position at all costs and that it was supposed to be a springboard for a new offensive, which obviously was out of touch for reality with reality as well. I mean, there was no way that the Germans with the dwindling supplies, you know, the troops demoralized and being battered to pieces that they could actually, you know, fill that area with fresh troops and launch new offensive. It just wasn't going to happen. Um, Rommel believed that they should just abandon North Africa. He realized that the end had pretty much come. Um, and when he suggested this to Hitler, um, Hitler threw a temper tantrum and, and uh, yelled at Rommel and accused his, his troops of being cowardly. Rommel was pretty shaken up by this. This was a different side to Hitler that he had not seen before. Uh, at least that's what comes across in his writings. Um, he also felt that he, he, he didn't know what to do because the high command, who he assumed cared on some level about the German soldiers, just didn't care about what happened to them at all. Now, Mussolini, on the other hand, was at first, he was just allergic to the idea that Rommel would, would retreat. Uh, he wanted him to hold El Aguila and attack from it. But then he later changed his mind and said, well, it's okay if you retreat to Buerat, uh, as long as you save the Italians. That was the only thing that Mussolini cared about. Um, he would lose his opportunity to save Italian North Africa if, all the, if Rommel just stood there and, and committed suicide. Um, so he was prepared to compromise as long as he, he preserved what he thought were Italy's best interests. So Rommel thinks he ought to just withdraw. He's pretty much lost hope of being able to succeed. Um, and he, he uses Mussolini's instructions as an excuse. So this wasn't what Hitler wanted. Hitler did not want him to withdraw to Borat, but Mussolini did. So he thought, well, Mussolini says I can. So um, he went on Mussolini's uh, orders or advice, or, rather. In fact, Rommel thought that he would he should ideally just retreat even farther back and if if at all possible, just evacuate North Africa, but that wasn't going to happen. Um, in the meantime, he instructed his troops to just stay there, you know, in accord with Hitler's orders until he figured out what exactly he was going to do. But regardless, nobody was able to give him an answer to his fuel problem or any kind of solution to stop Monty's outflanking movement or allied forces from closing in. Now, in the middle of all this, something kind of interesting happened. Uh, Hermann Goering decided that he was going to sabotage Rommel on a political level. So he starts disparaging Rommel in front of Hitler and Mussolini. He starts spreading rumors, questioning Rommel's sanity. Um, he's, uh, Goering's supposed to be in charge of the Luftwaffe while he starts withholding support. Um, being very fickle, he's frustrating Rommel's plans. Um, he and he also downplays Rommel's problems in front of these two leaders. He's like, "Oh, this guy, he's just making a big deal out of nothing. He's just going hysterical. We can handle this. Like, I could do a better job than him." Um, kind of a thing. So Rommel was really furious about Gehring. He wrote that he believed that Gehring was his bitterest enemy who wanted to get him sacked and take advantage of the situation in North Africa. Um, and in any case, uh, Goering wasn't able to provide any insights either. His, his advice was, well, 
either you retreat or you attack, or perhaps you can just do both at the same time, you know, which is ridiculous. Um, so Rommel was in complete despair when he went back to North Africa and he wrote that to keep the army from being destroyed as the result of some crazy order, we'd need all of our skill. This is just kind of a visualization of, of why he was having such a difficult time. Uh, as you can see, this is a Google map of El Aguila, modern day El Aguila on the lower right and we're at on the upper left. It's about almost a four hour drive today. Um, so that would use up a lot of Rommel's gasoline, you know, depending on whether he wanted to use the, the petrol in the fight or whether he wanted to use it to run away. Um, Hitler was saying, well, stay there and die. Mussolini said, well, you know, you're, you should be retreating. Just, just get the Italians out of trouble. And Goering, who, who could have probably, you know, made something happen with air support or the Luftwaffe, just wasn't interested in, in doing anything to alleviate Rommel's crisis. So Rommel gets back to North Africa and he's just totally shocked, demoralized. Um, he tells his staff uh, that the high command does not care about them. Um, his confidence is shaken and his writings indicate feelings of despair and I would say even hatred. Um, there are constant sentences accusing Hitler and um, the high command of blaming the fighting troops um, that his army, Rommel wrote that his army was a victim of Hitler, that Hitler didn't want to see the situation as it was. Um, I think many people have debated at what point in his life Rommel turned against Hitler. Some say that it was in the later stages of the war. I personally believe that the seeds of Rommel's uh, rebellion against Hitler started here at this point in North Africa when he realized that Hitler did not care about him or his men. And Rommel was, as, as I mentioned before, he was a very group oriented person. He believed he saw himself as part of his troops, part of the, the army. He had a really close relationship with his men. So I believe he felt betrayed by Adolf Hitler um, and I think that his his descent um, started at this point. Do you also think it may be influencing his attitude to it being kind of a um, uh, problem solving in that suddenly it's it's no fun anymore because he's under all this political pressure, conflicting ideas, conflicting instructions. His army is in danger of being cut off, you know, outmaneuvered and uh, worse than that captured or killed and suddenly it's like the chess game that he has enjoyed for for so long is now is now horrible and it's 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 not it's not fun anymore so not only does his attitude to hitler change his whole attitude to waging war does, does, do you agree with that i i do see a, a distinct lack of of energy from rommel in terms of coming up with new solutions he had he had been um capable of improvising and capable of just injecting energy and coming up with new plans, even in the past when he was faced with difficult situations. But at this point in North Africa, he seems to have just believed that everything was going wrong. And indeed it was, but he, he doesn't seem to, to me to have made a lot of, invested a lot of energy or, or optimism or creative or creativity as he had in the past. I think mm. at this point he had mentally just given up. And um, I would argue that 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 might have aff affected the way that things turned out. Perhaps if they had had a different commander who had had a level of skill, may have been able to, um, you know, handle the situation a bit differently. Um, but at this point, I think Rommel had pretty much lost his his spirits and his willingness to try and come up with a way out of, of the situation that he was in. Uh, I do think that to a large degree that the high command didn't really provide him with the resources that he would have needed earlier on. They just kind of thought, oh, we are doing such a great job, Rommel. Like, you don't need our help. Um, you, you can you can manage. And, like, they, supply ships would get sunk. But they really didn't take any decisive measures to invest a lot in the North African campaign. They invested more in the Eastern Front. Um, they didn't really devote a whole lot of strategic energy to North Africa. Rommel believed that North Africa was more important 
than the Eastern Front. He thought that taking the Suez Canal would have been a big boost um, for Germany. And he saw a greater, greater potential for the war in the long term in Egypt. Um, and I think to a certain degree that, that that's a pretty astute observation. Um, but Hitler and the high command were just so obsessed with their own ideology and propaganda that they kind of just let him do his own thing in North Africa. And then when things started to go wrong, they they were taken by surprise, uh, wanted him to take, wanted him to just figure a way out and didn't really care about, you know, making a concentrated uh, effort or on a strategic level to address the situation. Um, at this point, I just wanted to point out that North Africa had been a big boost to the Germans in terms of propaganda, even though um, Hitler wasn't really investing a lot there strategically. It, it worked out brilliantly for the Germans in terms of newsreels. I think that Rommel may have been one of the first celebrity generals, for lack of a better term. Um, they put him on magazine covers. Uh, they made a, a songs about him in the Africa Corps. Uh, Goebbels referred to him as, you know, the Führer's general, R. Rommel. Um, it was made very clear that he was this, um, the, one of the best that Germany had. And they really worked this. Any success that he made was really splashed in, in front of people everywhere. Um, I think there have been some accusations in the past that Monty was too flamboyant or that he courted the media too much. But the way that I see it, Monty was very focused on psychology. So whenever he gave press conferences or acted flippant, you know, about the Germans, I think that he did this on purpose because he wanted it to get back to Goebbels and the Germans. He wanted to just razz them, you know, so he would refer to Rommel as a nuisance, like we're going to hit him for six, or as we would say in the U.S., like knock him out of the park. Yeah. Um you know, said he at one point he referred to Rommel as a wet hand in one of the orders that he gave. Um, so just kind of funny stuff like that. But he did this, I, I believe, throughout the war uh, to kind of counteract the German propaganda. Um, in this instance, uh, Goebbels, once things started to go wrong for Rommel, he basically just pulled the plug on media coverage. Like if you go looking for newsreels about Rommel, during the period when he's losing, you won't really find any because like there was nothing good to say. So they just stopped saying anything. He just kind of just vanished off the radar completely. Uh, so I would say that both Monty and Rommel were under big pressure from the media, from a media standpoint here, because um, if Rommel lost, this would be bad for Germany in terms of public opinion after all of this building up that they had done uh, mm -hmm. about him. And if um, the British won, um, it would be a huge score, you know, on the propaganda scale for them, uh, boost people's spirits for the war effort. If the British lost, however, if Monty lost or, or had some kind of difficulty here, then Goebbels could always come back and they could resurrect some of the Rommel, you know, the, the Rommel myth or the Rommel mm. um, you know, persona that they had created. So it was pretty high stakes in terms of media perception. And also just to jump in, but 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 having had the victory at, at Alamein, Monty now has lots of supporters behind him, namely Churchill. I mean, Churchill has come up in previous shows this week. I mean, he's, you could argue his political career has been saved by the victory at Alamein. It has been a year or 18 months of, of defeat and after defeat after defeat mostly. And Churchill need, needs to give the the, the world a, a victory, and, and Alamein was that victory. So even if the pursuit and the, the withdrawal, the Rommel's withdrawal, in, in brings about some problems for Montgomery, and, and maybe he doesn't quite, you know, he has some draws rather than some victories. His 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 stake, his stock is very high right now, isn't it? He'd he'd have yeah. to really really fuck up to kind of drop <laughs> down a bit in at the moment. He's he's riding on the crest of that victory, whereas Rommel is in the opposite. Rommel is there, they're just pulling the plug completely. It's a fascinating um, paradoxical situation the two of them are now in, having been kind of equals in in their media of respect and coverage. Now now the 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 um the advantage is definitely with Montgomery right at the moment. 
Yeah, it's kind of another reversal in a way, another strange table turning moment yeah. where Monty's star is rising and Rommel's is is falling. And I also think that this will be I think that Rommel had resentment about this. And I think that that'll be a little bit obvious in the reflections after the battle, um, which I will show you. Um, but I do think that he was very much aware that Montgomery was the architect of his his downfall in some ways, and that he he wrote some kind of bitter um, bitter things about him um, in his memoirs. Um, in terms of the plan for the battle, uh, this is another interesting scenario because there weren't a whole lot of creative options to be had here for either one of them because of the terrain. Um, Monty pretty much. Um, like because of the position of the Mediterranean Sea and the desert, um, there wasn't a whole lot that he could do. Um, he wanted to outflank uh, Rommel's army. Uh, and so on the left flank, uh, the Africa Corps was shielded by the coast and other areas of approach were really hindered by the rough desert terrain. Um, the Germans' right flank was open across nearly 120 miles of desert. So Monty wanted to attack the Germans from the front and also close in to cut Rommel off um, from, from behind and from, from the side. Uh, Rommel predicted this. I mean, because honestly, there weren't a whole lot of other things that Montgomery could really do in this situation. Um, and so he, he kind of anticipated what was going on and, and was concerned about it. Now, on the other hand, Rommel didn't really have a set plan because he liked to improvise. He liked to make, he liked to make things up as he went. Um, he noticed Monty's weakness in that the British forces were concentrated in the front and there was kind of a gap between the van and the rear of, of Monty's forces. And in the past, Rommel had kind of lured the British out a little bit. And once the gaps developed, he would just send in his panzers and cut them up to ribbons. So he thought that he could possibly, if he had had enough fuel, he could have done something similar to Monty, let Monty come out and try and, and attack him, and then appear somewhere and ambush Monty and it kind of turn the tables. Monty was worried about this. He wasn't altogether sure that Rommel wasn't going to try something like this because it was a little bit difficult to predict Rommel um, as you know, he, he liked to improvise this, this terrain was favorable to him. Um, and he could, Monty believed that Rommel could in fact do something like this and he felt vulnerable and he was worried about it. So Rommel did consider doing such a thing, but he decided ultimately against it. He was pessimistic about the fuel supplies and he thought they just needed to get out of out of Dodge, uh, get away. So he, he noticed that Monty was building up his forces and he decides that he's just going to sneak off back to Borat at, at night. And so to appease Mussolini, he starts moving the Italians away first um, on December the 6th. And Rommel claimed that the Italians used most of his remaining fuel to get away kind of bitterly. Um, he told them to be as silent as possible, but he claimed that the Italians blew their cover by making noise and flashing headlights. And, um, you know, the British couldn't fail to notice that there was something going on over there. So the battle developed accidentally. Um, Monty had wanted to wait a little bit longer before attacking Rommel, but he notices that Rommel is trying to sneak off. So he thinks, well, this is the time I've got to jump on him now. So um, British artillery launches into action on the night of December the 11th. And for me, this is kind of like a wrestling match. Like Rommel's desperately trying to just squeeze away and Monty's just trying to, to pin him there and, and throttle him. Um, so Rommel's trying to retreat. Um, he's pretty upset. He thinks that the British are just going to attack in full force now. Um, Monty orders airstrikes. He want, he knows that Rommel's trying to escape and he wants to just destroy as much of Rommel's force as he possibly can. Um, during this time, the New Zealand division maneuvers behind the Africa Corps. And at, at one point during the battle, the New Zealanders and the British 7th Armored Division surrounded Rommel's entire army um, for a brief period of time. Uh, Rommel's HQ was bombed, his intelligence staff truck was destroyed, 
Rommel's almost finished, but Rommel's troops were also very clever and very experienced after all of their time in the desert. So they managed to dissolve into smaller groups and filter out through gaps in, in the British formations. They just kind of dispersed. And so the battle was really intense. Monty described it as confused. Um, the British were struggling to get through the Dune Sea to outflank Rommel's army. And there were uh, prisoners taken on both sides and released again and recaptured um, as Rommel's, um, his troops just tried to disperse and, and get away however they could uh, through the landscape. By the morning of December the 17th, some German tank crews Rommel wrote literally had to run out of fuel and they were saved by 20 canisters that were somehow delivered to them that enabled them to flee. Uh, in the meantime, the RAF sank 3,500 tons of fuel for Rommel in the Mediterranean. And so it was a really, really messy engagement. Rommel was pretty much defeated because he sustained 20% casualties. His his force that he had wanted to preserve was, was beaten pretty badly. He did manage to escape. I don't fault Monty in any way for, for losing him in this instance. I think that Rommel was a very slippery, tough character, and so were his troops, and I, it would have probably been very difficult for anybody to just nab them all at once. Um, but he did get pretty well mauled at Elagela, and for the first time in about two years, he no longer had this territory. He no longer had his springboard to get into Egypt, and he had lost even more ground. And he wrote that he was very angry and resentful at the German high command, and that he had to use up what he perceived to be his last drop of fuel. And just to jump in, and I want to reference the show I did today with Glenn Harper from New Zealand, is that you know, you're talking about the second New Zealand division now, and they did very well. Three, three left hooks they'd performed after El Alamein, but they, they are physically and mentally running on empty by this point. They've had two pretty major defeats before El Alamein going back the summer. And as, as good as they are, Freiburg has been wounded, was it 13 times eventually in World War II, their commander. So he's 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 run ragged. The troops are running out of, of energy. It doesn't matter how good they are. And everybody agrees the New Zealand troops, troops were fantastic. But they are just, they're flagging. And the 7th Armour Division, they've been at it for weeks as well. They are flagging. So so I, to, 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 to be a supporter of Montgomery, and I can't believe after years I'm not really liking Montgomery. I am a supporter of Montgomery. I can I can really see that that the criticism of him not pushing home a bit fast at this point is is somewhat unfounded. His troops are just they're just knackered. I mean they they they're going to need to just ease off a bit. So you know it, it's interesting. Rommel is under all this political pressure and he's running out of fuel, but Monty is under the pressure of his elite troops are just, they, 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 they can't go on forever. They're only human beings. Yeah. And he also wrote that that he was worried that he didn't have enough capacity to bring up reserves in time. He had to yeah. keep using these same these same units. He, he wasn't able to to bring any fresh, um, fresh blood or fresh um, energy to the front. So I think that's also part of the reason why um, the British had such a difficult time here. Um, because of all that exhaustion and, and everything that they were dealing with. Um, it was a big deal for them to actually take Elagila. Um, everybody was pretty delighted. Um, Monty wrote that the Elagila bo bogey had been laid and that the once dreaded position, um, that they were now able to just sail past it. So that was a huge boost in morale. You know, this spooky desert area that Rommel had managed to control for such a long time was just smash clear through. Um, interestingly, Monty wrote that the battle might have turned out very difficult for him, but and he was indicated that he was surprised that they turned Rommel out with relative ease. Um, just to give you an example of the effect that this had on Monty's troops, um, there's a little letter uh, that was written to him um, in late December after they had won this battle, um, a private wrote to him that for the first time in his army life, he felt like he belonged to something and he thanked Monty for this new feeling, saying that you have made us proud to belong to the 8th Army. So that's just an example of the effect that this had on the British in terms of um, what they had experienced in North Africa. Um, in terms of reflections, this is where we're going to look at 
what Rommel and Monty had to say after afterwards. So from Rommel's point of view, um, he was pretty sour at being kicked out of Elagala for all different kinds of reasons. And he he did write that Mon he believed Montgomery had, had committed one mistake, that Montgomery just should have known that they weren't going to accept battle and that he shouldn't have started attacking from the front and bombarding the strong points um, until he finished outflanking them. I think this is just kind of a, a little bit of, of bitterness on Rommel's part speaking because it contradicts certain facts about the situation. Uh, Rommel is ignoring the fact that Montgomery's forces were vulnerable to that sneak attack that he was thinking about doing previously. I mean, he, he doesn't mention that at all. Um, he doesn't mention how difficult the terrain was. Um, he did make a few jibes in, in his writings about how um, Monty's outflanking uh, column was was thin and weak, but I mean, given that knowledge, you know, he 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 doesn't include any of those considerations into why Monty wouldn't have you know wouldn't have you know delayed the action, or he criticizes him for being overcautious and accuses him that he did not follow up boldly and overrun them. But I mean, from my point of view, that's exactly what Monty was doing. I mean, they they did boldly, pretty crap, pretty much boldly crash through El Alamein and were overrunning in the process of overrunning them. So I, I think this is just kind of a little bit of of griping from Rommel. You know, he had just been kicked out of this place. Things were going badly for him, and he was just kind of, I think, trying to take some pot shots at his opponent here. Um, I mean, and to jump in again, because I'm sorry to go, is it, this I think is also where some of the seeds of the Italians being at fault comes from. Because I grew up in the area where the Italians were you know, disregarded; they're, they're they're always running away, they're surrendering, they're hopeless, they're this, that, and the other. And 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 as we know, and we'll have Julio on next week talking about Italian army. They 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 perform pretty damn well for a lot of the North African campaign, overreaching, doing well with, with bad equipment. And and because of Rommel, the, the reverence Rommel was, was held in the 50s and 60s, you know, years after his death by British American historians and staff colleges, that his comments about the Italians there of him stealing his fuel, I think they 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 help really seal that idea the Italians or a uh, hope lots of other things do as well but i think it's his temp his bitterness at the time has left a, 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 a negative on the historiography of the italian role in north africa yeah i, I would agree with you um I, I think that a lot of people just like make the mistake of taking what rommel says as doctrine in terms of like how how things should be done um but i mean rommel was only him and he, he had his own flaws and made mistakes and if you look at things critically i mean you can see um, that he's clearly not justified in saying that the British are being overcautious. I mean, at this point, they had literally just blazed right through the Germans at El Alamein and were chasing after them. Um, so this is just, I think, him him griping. Um, you know, he he was losing and he was trying to find different reasons to explain what had happened. Um, another reason why Monty, aside from the terrain and aside from the weakness in the outflanking movement and his difficulties with resupply, et cetera. Another reason he had to be careful was because of that media significance that I mentioned. I mean, he had just carelessly taken a whack at Rommel here at El Alagila, um, and, and something had gone wrong and, and things had gotten more tangled up or there were casualties or he had problems bringing up more reserve. Um, this would have been a, a favor to Rommel. It would have bolstered Rommel and, and made the British look bad. I mean, after after El Alamein. Also, um, Monty's troops would have been pretty demoralized. You know, they had been riding on this crest of victory and had faith in him. And this faith would have probably been at least halfway destroyed if he had some way, in some way, gummed it up at El Aguila. So he had a lot of reasons to be careful and thoughtful at, at this point. Um, from his point of view, he was really surprised that Rommel didn't take fuller advantage of El Aguila because it was such a, a difficult, nasty kind of place in the desert to attack. Um, he was surprised that Rommel had tried to sneak off to avoid the battle, and then Rommel more or less rapidly fled as Monty attacked him before the battle had even really been decided. 
he also wrote that he was uh, surprised that there was so much focus on where at. He, he thought that that was kind of a bad place to hole up. And and he thought that Mussolini had ordered Rommel to get to where at and that and that was where this focus came from. I think that Monty's a little bit mistaken here. I, I think it's true that Mussolini was involved in some way in influencing Rommel. But as I mentioned earlier, Rommel's political chiefs pretty much had no clue what to do and they wanted Rommel to figure it out. So I think he had a lot more freedom of action here. Um, the Hitler and the high command, they wanted Rommel, he, they wanted him to stay there and fight. Mussolini just wanted him to figure out what to do on his own to save the Italians. So the question for me is, why did he just want to run off? Was he just being practical about the fuel situation, about Operation Torch, uh, about prolonging the, the fate of the army? Or was he just being bitter? I mean, that's what's kind of difficult, um, to tell in this situation. I know before the battle, he wrote that they were up to their necks in mud and no longer had the strength to pull themselves out. So essentially, you have both generals basically thinking of each other as very strong in this situation and, and wondering in confusion why the other one didn't use his full strength here. So I think both of them were pretty jumpy at El Aguila. And I think that that's why the battle was so messy. Like. Monty was really anxious to just creep up on Rommel and pounce on him. And Rommel was very much aware that he was going to get pounced on and was trying to figure out a way how to escape before that happened. And when Monty did get his hands on him, there was a big fuss and the, the feathers really went flying. I think Rommel barely managed to squeeze away. Um, I, I don't think it was Monty's fault for losing him. Um, Rommel had a lot of experience being very crafty and learning how to sneak away. Um, his men were kind of similar in a way to guerrilla fighters. They were used to living in terrible conditions um, and being mobile, always on the move. So again, I think it would have been difficult for anyone to just bag Rommel and his entire force in one, one instance. But Monty did manage to severely maul the Africa Corps and block German access to Egypt. Um, a couple other things I think uh, that are worth looking at. Um, I've heard from other historians, uh, they, they think that Monty and Rommel were, were pretty similar. Um, I think in some ways they, they were, but for me, they were two extremely different characters. And, and one of the, the big differences for me is how they approached life on, on the battlefield. Um, Rommel basically insisted on living in the same conditions as his men. I mean, for him, this was about equality. He believed he was part of that big group, the community, his troops. He allowed himself very few comforts. He would argue and fight with his staff if they tried to give him any extra food um, or any extra comfort. He perceived this as extra privileges and he just disdains them. This looks like a mark of honor for him. He wanted to live just like an infantryman as much as possible. However, this also meant that he would get physically ill and physically tired from rough infantry style living. Uh, Monty, he was also very strict and sparing with himself. He was focused on fitness, um, discipline, um, but he did, I think, have higher personal standards. It, he viewed it as his duty to stay clear minded. He realized that as a leader, he, his duty was very different from the men because he was the one that had to sit back and think. He had to make the plan. His decisions were going to affect everyone else. So he would set aside time for rest, for quiet. He, you know, he he refused to have alcohol. You know, he refused to to allow his mind to be cluttered or influenced anyway. And he also tried to make conditions as clean and comfortable for himself and others as possible. I think this probably had to do with the conditions he, he lived in in World War I. He wrote how dirty and awful everything was, and he knew how that affected people's state of mind. Um, so he, throughout his life, he would try and make things as clean, as sanitary, as comfortable for everyone as possible that they would have to live and work and fight in those conditions, he wrote. Rommel, on the other hand, didn't really care. It was kind of like, um, I, I think maybe a different cultural perspective too. 
Um, like they would just have to overcome whatever difficulties. It was just a sign of strength to just deal with with the dirtiness and and the grit and and just put up with it. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that um, Monty got a lot better performance out of his troops than Rommel and also from himself. Monty didn't, for example, come down with desert illnesses when he was leading the 8th Army. Rommel got diphtheria. Um, you know, he was he was pretty worn ragged, and this was just from his decision to live in this way. Um, I think part of it also might have been because Rommel had never served outside of Europe, so he didn't have previous tropical experience as a soldier. Monty was already an old pro. He had been to India several times, Palestine, you know, he knew different kinds of environments. Um, so Monty already had some experience there. Um, Rommel was pretty good at desert fighting, but I think Monty was better at making the desert more bearable for himself and his men. I think perhaps if Rommel had lived longer or had had more experience in different theaters of war, perhaps he would have evolved and perhaps he would have approached things differently. Uh, but because his experience was limited, I think that that affected his behavior in North Africa and how he handled things. Um, a case in point, before the battle, Monty went to Cairo to clean up, to wash and to rest, and Rommel went straight from the desert to emergency conferences and then straight back to Africa. He had little to no time to refresh himself. I think that probably his stress and his fatigue might have influenced his decision making. Um, I mean, it's just not good for your health to be doing these things all the time, uh, nonstop. And so I think that might have influenced his ability to think clearly. Um, also, Monty was a little bit older than Rommel. And I think that that might have contributed to him being a little wiser about things. And uh, it's also his pursuit of continuing education his experiences in different countries, his studies of leadership and the human factor. I think that that was a really great breadth of knowledge about soldiering and Rommel did not have all of those facets to his knowledge. And I think that that showed, um, especially in, in North Africa when these two encountered each other. And last but not least, um, the question of morale. Monty said that this was the most important factor in any battle. Um, the big thing in war, he used to call it. And at this point, Rommel had lost faith in his leadership. He was deeply shaken up by Hitler's lack of concern about the troops. He was kind of having a crisis of faith in the leadership of his country. And his heart wasn't in the fight anymore. He thought that they were going to lose. Um, North Africa and that the war was was going in, in the wrong direction. And um, so his morale, I would say, was pretty much at ground zero at this point. And Monty, on the other hand, was riding pretty high. He believed in his cause. He was full of energy. He was pretty much prepared to do anything he could to win. He was really heart and soul in the war. Um, and I think that this also influenced the outcome because um, Monty wrote... A commander has to watch carefully his own morale. If his heart begins to fail him when the issue hangs in the balance, then the enemy commander will probably win. And that's exactly what happened. So whew. anyway, I hope you all enjoyed the, the presentation. That's pretty much it. Um, if there are any questions, um, I'm ready for any questions if you've got any. Um, um, well, the, the first. Well, firstly, uh, you're getting a massive virtual round of applause. I, I put a comment on the sidebar already about who wants me to invite you back again, and it was a resounding yes, yes, yes. And three or four people, myself included, have just ordered your your book on Montgomery. I didn't think I need another book on Montgomery, but apparently I do. So, uh, of all this, so so absolutely brilliant. So, um, yeah, um, uh, I, there's no questions right now. There was a couple of questions early on about which you kind of answered about how Rommel's relationship with with other generals and staff officers. I mean, you've kind of already answered it, but um, not, not great in many ways is the certain people above him. Would you, is that, is that your assessment? Um, you mean like, what, was he kind of cantankerous with other, with other people? Just, just getting on with them. You know, the, the, particularly the kind of paper shuffler kind of officers that you know, you, you're going to, you're going to have to work with in that kind of command situation where Montgomery is obviously with his staff college background and staff officer, he's much more comfortable with those kind of, 
the, 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 the officers who never leave the mess kind of, you know, people who are sitting in the offices, the guys who crunch the numbers. Rom, Rommel's not very good at dealing with those kind of people, is he? Or not? No, I'm putting that word in. I'm asking you what you think. I should. No, um, he, he was not. I, I think he tended to show a bias towards those uh, soldiers he perceived to be like uh, fellow infantrymen, you know, people who had had combat experience, who, who didn't mind being rough living and, and getting out in the front. Uh, he kind of had a disdain for who he referenced as office chair soldiers. Um, and so he did, I think, discriminate against the staff in some ways. He believed that they they didn't really have a real point of view about what was going on. He very much had the idea that you could only understand a battle if you were right at the front and in the thick of it. And if you weren't there, then then it didn't matter. You know, and I think that this was a big drawback. Um, very often, um, even in his experiences in the First World War, um, he just wanted to charge ahead and have other people just catch up with him. And realistically, that's not how it works. Also, if you're not the supreme commander, um, you can't be just making everyone catch up with you. You have to follow the larger strategic goal. And and he he kind of wanted to set his own goals and expect mm. people to catch up. And so I think if, if people didn't, he would knock heads with them frequently. He was perceived by other commanders as an upstart. Um, there was also a degree of classism in the German army. So the Prussians, you know, the old noble families who had been in the military forever, they didn't like him and he didn't like them either. So there were some tensions um, depending on their social background and what region of Germany they came from. I, I don't know if that really answers. Right, that's, a perfect, that's a perfect answer. Thank you very much. And this is another question from MRK, but I'm not actually going to have you answer that because what I'm going to do is I'm, it's about uh, Montgomery's performance later in the war, the Battle of the Scheldt Estuary. We could also include Normandy and Market Garden, but I'm going to actually extend to you the invitation to come back and talk about Montgomery properly. Uh, I'm not going to ask you next week. It'll be in a few, you know, few weeks or months' time. But honestly, I don't think I wanted a, a two-minute response. That I'd rather have you back and actually examine that at a, at a greater length. So it, just to put it out there, that people are interested in continuing your understanding of Montgomery. We had a couple of people asking about Ron, Rommel's. Um, relationship with nazism you know because there's been lots of debates over the years as to how you know where he is on the scale of being a good german to a nazi and uh, you know and without putting again what what where's your feeling about his him on that scale well i i will say that i have studied um nazi ideology and and the ss and and things like that um for different articles and research projects and, and you, you speak fluent german as well don't you so yes. yeah Yes. And so uh, when I read articles and documents written by those kind of guys, I do not see that level, that, that ideology permeating through Rommel's writings. I mean, most of the time it can be a little bit obvious that will make racist remarks, you know, um, things, you know, things of that nature. Uh, Rommel's writings don't have any of those things. He also, in his photography, um, I would have expected photographs by somebody who was really into Nazi ideology to reflect Nazi interests, you know, like um, big pictures of swastikas or, you know, pictures demeaning the enemy, pictures of the dead, you know, things like that. I didn't find anything like that in Rommel's photography. I think Rommel was a very kind of narrow-minded man in some regards. He was a bit pig-headed. I think that he was very patriotic about Germany and and he also excluded things from his viewpoint in in terms of soldiering he he didn't go out of his way to learn about different approaches to war very much about different military commanders about world history um he just kind of stayed in Germany and did his own thing so I think um, I wouldn't put him down, I, I don't think, as a Nazi, although he did obviously um, you know, support the, the war effort. Um, he later changed his, his perceptions, um, so, which is why he ended up dying um, in 1944. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I wouldn't really, I don't believe at this point from what I've seen that he ascribed to Nazi ideology in any way. I mean, it's it's not a binary thing. You you don't you can 
it's, there's, there are other positions to be than a fervent Nazi and an anti-Nazi. And I think he's somewhere in the middle. I mean, as people are commenting in the sidebar, you know, he there are deportations of Jews under his command. There are things that, you know, that there are there are things that are happening within his sphere that are, are Nazi-like. And then there are also things that he's involved in, care of prisoners of war, things like that that are are not Nazi-like. So I think, you know, our need in 2022 to put everybody into any, a very neat category of uh, either a Nazi or not a Nazi, there are there are areas in between. And I think he falls somewhere in between. I don't know where exactly he falls, but he's, yeah, he's he's not up there with Heydrich and Himmler, clearly. But like, at the other end, he's he's clearly not a, he's not the good Samaritan either. He's he's, he's somewhere in, in the middle. So, um, yeah, a very self-interested person. That, I would that's say. come up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very focused on his own sphere and and thinking he can do his follow his own little sphere of interest and and to the exclusion of of other things until I would say eventually it, things got to a point where he did have to make a decision uh, eventually because um, of his um, feelings of antagonism towards Hitler. Uh, eventually, he came to a point where he was collaborating with or corresponding with people who were plotting against Hitler. So I think uh, time and experience eventually forced him to a point where he had to decide what side that he was on. Mm. And at, at that point, he decided that he was against Hitler. But um, it's very difficult to determine the details, not least of all because Rommel actually burns a lot of his papers uh, that he wrote Um in 1944, um, his son Manfred said that he had written a lot about um, his feelings and thoughts in the aftermath of D-Day, um, in like the immediate aftermath of it, and that he burnt these things because he didn't want them to be found by the Third Reich authorities. So it's difficult to know um, yeah. all of his thoughts about that, those things, but he definitely had a kind of a narrow-minded approach to life in general, and I think as well, you know, as his own what he perceived to be his own military interests. No, that's a perfectly wonderful nuanced historian's answer there. So um, easy one to answer now. Um, did Montgomery and Rommel ever communicate you know, personally, i.e. arranging truces for the removal of wounded or dead? I mean, they obviously have, you know, Rommel, Montgomery famously has photos of Rommel in his caravan that you're, you're sitting in tonight. But do they actually have any personal communication ever? Uh, not that I am aware of. Um... I, I believe Monty would have, have written about it. Um, he, he was pretty curious about Rommel. Um, and one of his regrets in life, he, he said, was not having met him or interacted with him because he was just so curious about his famous opponent, he said. Mm. So I think if he would have had any direct communication, we, we would probably know about it. But not that, not that I'm aware of. Okay, well, we've got lots of questions. We can't answer them, ask them all. But one from another regular, now that one, Gary there, is asking... Uh, your thoughts about the Rommel papers, the manuscript, what agenda or agendas, if any, do you have think may have informed his writing? Again, you kind of covered that a little bit a minute ago about the, the burnings of his writings. But um, any particular response to that specific question? Um, I don't really, in terms of agendas, it really depends what you mean. Um, I don't really see any particular ideology informing the way that he wrote his memoirs um, in terms of his own personal agendas. Um, from reading the Rommel papers, I just get the sense of Rommel the mathematician analyzing his campaigns, going through meticulously in detail when things happened, how many things were, uh, how many, you know, tanks and things like that, and kind of um, analyzing what went wrong, what went right. Um, there is a definite shift in the tone of his papers when he starts to lose. Um, mm then it's not so fun anymore. Then it's not so easy to sit back and, and criticize Wavell and Ritchie and, and things like that. Um, then his papers tend to in, incorporate more critical comments about Hitler, about the high command, um, about various people who he believes aren't helping his army. Um, and then the papers tend to taper off. They get kind of sparse uh, towards uh, Normandy. Uh, he's very focused on just uh, getting on and doing his job and he doesn't have as much time or energy to sit back and, and reflect about things and some of that bitterness starts to come to the fore um, at, towards the end of the papers. So okay. um, I th also think that, like I said earlier, um, he was a little bit biased in his um, approaches to some commanders. 
um, he had great things to say about all of the people that he beat in North Africa. But like the one person that reversed his fortunes, Montgomery, he definitely has gripes. He's definitely trying to point out things that he thought he wasn't good at. Um, and you don't really get that sense of, um, you know, gotcha from Rommel when, when you're talking about Wavell or Richie or Auchinleck. So um, I think he definitely had some bitterness towards Monty. It, it, it got personal is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and we'll do one more question because otherwise we'll be here all the rest of the day. Although you have convinced me that I think I should do a panel discussion at the end of these two weeks because I've been toying with John Parshall wants to come back. And I'm thinking if you want to, that you could come back. I really think I'm, I'm, I want to do a closing panel discussion with two or three of you historians and just thrash out some of the conclusions about I mean, we'll, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. But um, the last actual question is what Rommel's view was from the Great Dominion, the Rommel's view of his successor, Hans-Jürgen oh. von Arnim and his conduct of the war in Tunisia, because obviously Rommel, it's over for him personally, but did he, li did he make any remarks about how the campaign was, was handled after his departure? Um, I, I do believe, from what I recall, that he made a few remarks that he thought von Arnhem was doing a fairly good job, but that he didn't believe that von Arnhem was being given enough support, right. uh, you know, from from the high command and so on. That he that von Arnhem did what he could, um, but it wasn't enough, and and Rommel um, felt that they were had been doomed anyway. Um, interestingly, Rommel did make some remarks in his writings that he he um, missed his men, that he corresponded with them in POW camps. Um, and, and you kind of get the impression that he would have preferred to go down with his ship. He would have preferred mm. to have been captured and go in with them and that being separated from them um, and being recalled uh, to Europe and, and just cut off from his little group of troops um, left a, a bitter scar and, and a lot more bitterness um, in him. He, he wanted to, to stay with them. So yeah, I mean, I, I went to a lecture by Manfred Rommel, oh God, years ago. And, and Manfred, as I recall, said that he believed his father by the time of Normandy was suffering from what we'd call survivor's guilt. You know, he, he, he felt that he'd been given an opportunity to get away from North Africa and that, and that people he'd left behind didn't have the opportunity and that that was something. I mean, I don't know whether the expression survivor's guilt even existed back in the 1940s. It's probably one of those more modern terms, but that was something Manfred said. So that's that's interesting. Um, so, But I think we will have to leave things in, otherwise it, it, it will just be here forever. But I think I'll just I'll get on the emails and we'll, we'll think about a panel discussion if, if possible. It'd be probably the same day next week, next Friday, I'm thinking. But because John Parshall's up for it. And if you are you up for it provisionally, yeah, theoretically? Sure. And then I've got to find a third person because I think just to kind of thrash out some conclusions about uh, doctrinal changes, leadership changes will be really good and kind of bring you in for the leadership aspect. Uh, perhaps someone else in for the tactical doctrine aspect and John for kind of the the overviews of uh, John has been has spent 13 years and he's got two more to go on a book about 1942. So he has been stuck in this year, year for 13 years now. So he's got lots to say. So we'll do that. But, um, Peter Caddick Adams is a possibility. I might, I, actually, I'll ask Peter. I'll ask if Peter's around. That'd be really fantastic. But yeah, I'll get working on that over the weekend. But it's been absolutely amazing talking to you. I I, I love it when we have a brilliant debut i mean i know when certain people come on like james holland and jenny grant they're going to be fantastic but when someone i didn't know who you were two weeks ago no offense but thanks to claire uh told me who you were and then you've come on and just uh, to use an american expression you have knocked it out of the park today so oh. absolutely fantastic show it is up there with john partials as my favorite of the week although i've loved them all now fantastic stuff i can't superlatives are not coming out fast enough so it, i don't know whether you're nervous or not but you were bloody brilliant well, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. I've, I've really enjoyed it. And I hope everyone else, all the viewers have too. Um, and if you do ever want to have a discussion or a longer presentation about Monty, I'm definitely. <laughs> no, definitely. I, you, you, if you want to come back, I definitely, the Shell Destry comes up a lot in discussions and his role with the Canadians. I think I'd like you to be there and have a Canadian historian on or two and we can kind of thrash out. So I don't, I don't think I want to do Arnhem because Arnhem, everyone's too entrenched in their opinions. There's nothing, there are new things to say, but no one wants to listen. <laughs> but with the Shelt Estuary, there are possibly are some, some things that, that are worth listening or or Sicily is another possibility because I'm doing a week or two on Sicily next year. That's not, anyway, we'll we'll discuss that later on. But folks, 
Uh, I'm off for the weekend, then Monday it all cracks off again with Richard Hammond talking about the maritime war for LMA, and I will get working on that panel discussion for next Friday. So it's been an absolute pleasure. I will remind you again, the links to Zita's website are in the description below, novelist, uh, military articles, books about Rommel, a book about Montgomery, and a novel about North Africa as well, isn't there, which I put the link to, which I, I feel I might get that as well for some, holiday, light, some lighter holiday reading. But no, absolutely amazing. So um, folks, I'm going to leave it with you. Um, thank you everybody for watching. This is Paul Woodard for World War II TV saying enjoy your weekend. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Bye.